Thanks, guys. Uh, I want to thank George and the organizers, Dr. Singh and everybody, for inviting me this year. It uh, looks like it's been another great meeting. I'm going to talk about pedal artery interventions and deep venous arterialization, and I apologize if some of the slides are simplistic because we have a whole host of residents and eight vascular fellows every year, and you can imagine that sometimes I have to kind of simplify things just to get the, the point across. So without further ado, what are we seeing today? Because of the explosion of diabetes and CKD, we're seeing bad or big artery disease, multi-level CTOs, a predominance of below knee and below ankle disease, and we know there's some histologic work that's showing that we've got cells of cartilage and bone in tibial CTOs. So clearly that makes revascularization very difficult. We're also seeing sad or small artery disease. So the microvasculature that's uh, less than about 100 micrometers in size is being destroyed by you know, the, the combination and sometimes just with diabetes alone. We're not only seeing heavy intimal calcification, but also MAC or medial arterial calcification. And we all know that's independent of atherosclerosis. It's a strong marker of future cardiovascular events and death. And obviously, you've all seen this angiographically when, you, when you've looked at angiograms of the legs or you've looked at foot x-rays and you see that railroad type calcification in the, in the vessels, which obviously makes recanalization very difficult and sometimes impossible. We obviously all want to achieve this perfect result where we're able to get a nice three-vessel runoff, good inflow, good outflow. But more often than not, in today's world of CLI, this is what we're seeing, bad outflow. So what are our options? We've got a couple. We've got obviously pedal artery interventions or pedal loop reconstruction. We've got deep venous arterialization. So let's talk about each one. I think to really understand pedal artery interventions, we have to talk about the below ankle anatomy. It's not something that everybody does or sees, but I think it's important and becoming more important as time goes on. We know that the vessels below the ankle, it's the final major outflow of the leg. There are three commonly described anastomotic loops, the pedal plantar loop, the deep pedal arch, and the arcuate artery. So let's go over all these. So when it comes to the pedal plantar loop, this is the most common when you see great cases that are done live, when you see great cases on social media. This is really the, the loop that people are intervening on or tackling. It's, it's complete in approximately 90% of cases. It connects the anterior and posterior circulation. And as, a, as you can see here, a good landmark when you're actually intervening on these patients is an AP view like this, and looking really at the base of the first and second metatarsal, the so-called first metatarsal space, which gives rise to the deep perforating artery and ultimately anastomosis with the lateral plantar artery and back to the PTA. So it's kind of good landmarks, and I'll show you what that looks like. The next uh, anastomotic loop is really the deep pedal arch, and this one is really formed by the medial plantar artery in the medial tarsal artery and, you know, really becomes a dominant communication or connection when you have forefoot amputations or significant disease or occlusion of the pedal plantar loop. Unfortunately, it tends to be na narrow, it's difficult to navigate, it tends to be very fragile, and so it's not really something that's easily intervened upon. Finally, we've got the uh, anastomotic loop formed by the arcuate artery, and again, this is a branch of the dorsalis pedis artery at the first metatarsal space. You get the arcuate artery, which then anastomosis with the lateral tarsal artery this time, and then back to the anterior tibial. And what you can see here is that it's a more proximal communication. There's your pedal plantar loop, which arises a little bit more distal. And obviously this, when it's present, uh, which is rare, uh, gives good supply to the dorsal digital arteries. So what does that look like in real time? So what I did was I took Marco Manzi's uh, image from his article. Uh, to show you what a normal pedal plantar loop looks like. And the key finding here, the key landmark, again, is between the base of the first and second metatarsal. You can see there's your pedal plantar loop. Here's a CLI patient I had with all the classic risk factors, diabetes, et cetera, uh, who had you know, significant forefoot ischemia and gangrene, and so we were reconstructing the pedal plantar loop, and I wanted to show you a couple of landmarks. So as far as catheter systems, obviously we don't, we're not gonna talk about those, but again, all the microcatheters you're familiar with that you use in the coronaries, you use in the periphery, regalia, fielder, command 18, 
Command 14, all these guide wires, V14, et cetera, all do well in this space. So again, if you look at this loop, I want you to notice the yellow arrow. What I'm trying to show you is notice the subtle prolapse or the buckling of the guide wire there. That's the tip off that that's the first branch or the deep perforating artery. And again, I'm going to show you that. And then if you look at the base of the third or fourth uh, metatarsal, you can see, depending on the obliquity of the AP view, that that's typically going to give you um, the second branch or the second connection into the lateral plantar artery. Obviously, there are pedal loop anatomic variations, and so you have to be aware of these because not everybody has the classic uh, pedal plantar loop anatomy that, we're, we, that we think about. So let's go over a quick case. Classic patient with uh, significant small artery disease or SAD. This is a class CLI patient with all the normal risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, etc. Had basically four-foot ischemia, gangrene on multiple toes, and you can see the anterior tibial arteries occluded at the ankle joint. We've got a diseased posterior tibial artery, but we have a little bit of a path in that lateral plantar artery. And so what we decided to do after discussion, we have a multidisciplinary discussion with our, our surgeons and our cardiologists and IRs, and, and we decided to tackle the pedal plantar loop here. We decided to use a posterior approach. In other words, we're going via the posterior tibial artery, which we reconstructed. So after accessing it, we used IVIS or EVIS to really size the vessel because most people tend to under dilate or undersize their balloon when it comes to tibial interventions and especially below ankle interventions. We did good vessel prep. In this case, we did orbital atherectomy. We did prolonged low pressure angioplasty, four atmospheres, maybe five atmospheres, two, three minutes. And then basically we tackled from the lateral plantar artery into the deep perforating artery, ultimately into the dorsalis pedis artery and the AT and you can see that on this run here, what's filling is really the ATDP, and we've got either spasm uh, or something else going on with the posterior tibial and the lateral plantar artery. Again, additional angioplasty, prolonged, a lot of nitroglycerin, et cetera, vasodilators, and we were ultimately able to uh, complete the pedal plantar loop in this case. If you show you another case, another one, classic CLI patient uh, who, who presented with profound ischemia. He had dependent rubor elevation pallor. You can see there's multiple sites of ulceration and gangrene and had really nothing below the knee. We opted to really go after an angiosome directed type therapy. So we're basically opening up the vessels directly supplying the ischemic tissue in this case. So we, we recanalized the anterior tibial artery, the pedal plantar loop. As you could see, we were unable to get into the posterior tibial artery, unfortunately. And luckily, this patient had a lot of hibernating vessels uh, in the forefoot, and we were able to really achieve a nice angiographic and ultimately a clinical result. So where are we now in terms of data? You know, I was invited to kind of review the data on pedal plantar interventions back in 2021, and then again by the vascular surgery team at, in seminars in vascular surgery, and that's in press now, but it really sh it highlights a lot of the uh, data that's available currently in terms of advanced limb salvage and pedal artery interventions. And the conclusions that, you know, really have been shown based on multiple really non-randomized controlled data and meta-analyses is that there is a high success rate in terms of the pedal plantar loop intervention, almost 85 to 97 percent in experienced hands, obviously. You can see primary patency rate is, is 50 percent at one year, but there is a high restenosis rate. And remember, the failure rate is sometimes 50 to 60 percent in these interventions. So this is not something that is successful all the time. These are limb salvage cases, obviously, and you can see limb salvage and amputation-free survival rates were pretty good. And although we've got some positive data regarding pedal artery interventions, you can see we have a lack of randomized controlled trial data. There's really no societal guidelines on when to intervene. We don't know the extent of pedal artery reconstruction that's needed to really optimize the outcomes. There's a lack of training on most vascular specialists who perform PAD or CLI interventions. And as a result, there's a lack of widespread adoption. So what's our other choice? Our other choice is deep venous arterialization. And what is this? So basically, this involves creating a connection uh, between a proximal arterial inflow vessel and a distal venous outflow, commonly the posterior tibial vein, sometimes the anterior tibial vein, depending on the, if you're using a device. And obviously, you have to disrupt all the venous valves in that outflow vein and occlude any draining collateral veins because you need to optimize flow to the foot. 
you're basically forcing arterial blood from the arterial system into the plantar venous arch, and ultimately you want to get it into Lejar's venous plexus, which is a dermal and subdermal, subdermal venous plexus to supply the ischemic tissues, relieve rest pain, and heal chronic wounds. You can see here that basically you're forcing blood down into the posterior tibial vein and plantar venous arch and ultimately into the tissues of the foot here. It's not a new concept. It's been around since 1902. The first surgical DVA was performed then, but the concept, the equipment, the tools were not mature, and so as a result, the outcomes were poor. Today, we've got several techniques, including uh, surgical, hybrid, and endovascular techniques. We still don't have clear guidelines at this point in terms of what constitutes an end-stage CLI patient, but I think most uh, of us that treat these patients and most of our experts on the panel would agree that a desert foot with no endo or bypass options, multiple prior failed interventions, and obviously no existing major infection would probably be an ideal candidate for DVA. So although the mechanism of action is clear, we know from some of the limited data now that using a vein in its venous bed as a conduit for perfusion increases flow through uh, the hibernating collaterals, it improves perfusion in the capillary beds and tissues, and then ultimately stimulates angiogenesis, which ultimately over time improves the microvasculature and the target tissues, ischemic markers. Um, are reduced, and then obviously we've got some studies now that are showing that the TCPO2 rises to significant levels by really six to eight weeks post-DVA. Obviously, many of us have been doing this off the shelf for years. In 2013, the LymphFlow device uh, came online in terms of its initial uh, you know, safety and feasibility and so forth. It basically has dedicated uh, catheters for arterial and venous access to create the connection between the artery and the venous system. It's got a dedicated valvotome to destroy the and disrupt the venous valves in the outflow vein to optimize flow to the foot. And then it has some uh, a conical or you know uh, uh, some good sizing in terms of stent grafts to really optimize the attachment points between the artery and vein. Let's look at a case to get an idea of what this looks like. The classic DVA patient, you can get, again see that this patient has profound ischemia, gangrene, was really end stage. There were no surgical options. He did not have a vein or any type of uh, conduit for bypass. He had been intervened on numerous times and still was not healing despite uh, opening up his pedal plantar loop. And you can see he also has corresponding SAD or small artery disease, which is a major problem here. As a result, what did we do? We did this off the shelf, actually. So we have a uh, six French catheter sheath system from above in the distal posterior tibial artery. We've accessed the lateral plantar vein, which you can see here with a five French sheath. And you can see I put an arrow to kind of remind everybody where is that lateral plantar vein on the foot when you're looking at it. And this is what it looks like when you're looking under ultrasound. It actually tends to be a lot more uh, easily seen than you would expect, and it's a lot bigger, which is interesting. So once we had that access, we basically put snares from above and below, classic gun sight technique to get through and through access, and then ultimately externalize your wire, and then pull it up through your sheath, reverse your access, and then you can perform your intervention from above. In this case, we are not using a limb flow device. This is off the shelf stuff. And so as, as a result, we're using high pressure balloons to really disrupt and fragment those venous valves. You can see that, you, that a lot of times you'll get tight wastes. Uh, you might have to do this numerous times to get these things to crack. We ultimately then uh, did our first angiogram and you can see here that all these veins are filling, but you can see the problem here is that the anterior portion of that plantar venous arch is really not optimized. And remember, for this to be successful in terms of he healing a TMA or forefoot uh, ischemia, you really need the plantar venous arch optimized and you need it ultimately to reflux not only to the capillaries but ultimately into that Lejar's venous plexus that we talked about. So again, additional high pressure angioplasty to really force open some of these valves, get the flow going. Ultimately, you can see that on the final, we were able to get uh, you know, a robust, uh, a good result with robust filling of the plantar venous arch. So what about the data? Well, you know, a few years ago, the Mass General Group, Dr. Ho, Dr. Dua, and them published a meta-analysis really looking at the 12 open studies, the three endo studies, and the two hybrid studies that are available uh, for DVA. 
And you can see, now remember, these are all comers. They don't really include the lymph flow data, although some of the early uh, few patients were included. And you can see that the primary patency, limb salvage rate, wound healing is all over the place, right? It's as low as, uh, it's low and then it's high. And you, same thing on the endo side, again, it's all over the place and not as good as the surgical side in this case. Shortly thereafter, you can see that a lot of the lymph flow data came online. The PROMISE 1 and ALPS registries were completed. PROMISE International and PROMISE 2 U.S. Pivotal Trial is ongoing. But what we gleaned from it is that you can see that these were all comer CLI patients with all the classic risk factors and all the issues that we, we see on a daily basis. But ultimately, uh, they were able to publish their PROMISE 1 results in the Journal of Vascular Surgery and showed really a 77% limb salvage rate at 24 months. And wounds were healed or healing at two years in 92% of patients, which is really uh, amazing uh, data when you think about it. Uh, thank you.